Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Narcissistic Roommate Accuses Me and My Brother of Stealing, Being Self-Centered, and Endangering His Life. The second story, Sewing 100 Masks Alone in 4 Days is Suicide. The third story, Warning, Aggressive Geese in the Building. The first story is, Roommate forces me to move in the middle of a global effing apocalypse pandemic with a newborn baby. It's my birthday. Roommate gets effed by karma. Today is my 31st birthday, during a global pandemic on 331. I would say that's notable, momentous, even eventful some might say. But that's not why I'm writing to all of you. Coronavirus can kiss my A. Hell is other people. All of this started partially by my own doing a year ago. I agreed to a room share with my knowingly narcissistic friend of 17 years. He was moving back to the States after living in China for three years. He seemed more well-adjusted. He had met the partner of his dreams. I love this person. I thought to myself, everything will be fine, OP. You know how to put up with his BS. You'll save money. It'll be great. Obviously, the other doormat humans of the world know that this was a serious and egregious oversight on my part. Cartoonish foolish. Definitely 100% will end with OP getting treated like dirt. All of you can skip to the end. Things were okay at first. He slept on my couch for two weeks without paying rent before my lease was up. Smoked all my weed, you know, the normal SH. Him, my brother, whom I've been roommates with for the better part of five years, and myself sign a lease on the outskirts of a trendy neighborhood. It's the kind of neighborhood that has a hipster coffee shop right next to a restaurant that's only open three days a week, right next to a condemned crack house, and you're pretty sure it's just a drug front, but whatever. You're only 10 minutes from downtown, and no one's broken into your house yet. Life is great. We all made decent money, even if we hated our jobs. Three months in, the saga begins. Roommate smokes insane amount of weed and pops Adderall to focus all the time. Laziest tweaker I've ever effing seen. Roommate accuses brother and I of stealing money from him, because he spent $1,500 in one month on weed, for personal use, and smokes the occasional bowl with us. Roommate has a job working at a highly specialized summer camp at a well-recognized university. Roommate works from home nine months out of the year and supervises teenagers for three months during the summer, all while getting paid 45k a year with those cushy government benefits. I really wish I could get paid that to smoke weed and play computer games. Life really would be great. Roommate's fiancé gets arrested for drugs in totalitarian country. I ask roommate to treat me like a human because it freaks me out that he never speaks to me and never leaves his room. I'd also appreciate it if he cleaned up after himself. Roommate says I'm insensitive for asking him to be cordial occasionally, because I'm experiencing depression, also, and would like for him to at the very least ask me how my effing day was every once in a while. We were good friends for some time after all. He's just under so much stress right now due to fiancé troubles, and job that he can't be bothered to acknowledge my existence. He also can't be bothered to acknowledge the existence of his dishes, trash day, an ashtray, or his actual job. Summer comes, I quit my job because I hate it and it's slowly eating my soul. I do not have another job, but I'm done. I take a job supervising children at the summer camp for one month. Things continue to deteriorate. Roommate's fiancé flees totalitarian country to avoid mandatory community service in home state and comes to live in our house rent-free indefinitely. Roommate's fiancé is a lovely person. Brother and I get along very well with him. Roommate elopes, they get a puppy, violating lease term as the only dog allowed on property is brother's dog. All is well. I get two jobs which I love. I'm happy and busy and social and I don't need that a-hole. I pretty much write that friendship off at this point and just want to get through the lease without any volcanic explosions. Brother's FWB gets pregnant and decides to keep it. She moves in with us too. I'm okay with this because she's a good human and also needs a safe place to incubate a tiny person. I now live in a three-bedroom house with four other humans and two dogs, and continue to pay one-third of the rent and bills. Brother's partner and I do nearly all the cleaning despite the fact that roommate and husband are always home and cooking, and we all go to work. Fall and winter come and go, I try to keep the peace. Doormats and pushovers enter here. Spring arrives and Australia is on fire. Kobe Bryant dies in a helicopter crash. China has some nasty SH going on, and I shamefully watch Love is Blind on Netflix. Everything is fine. 
After weeks of discussion dodging by my roommate, we politely tell roommate that we do not wish to cohabitate with him and new husband. After the end of the lease term, new baby is due in March, and I've accepted that I'd rather live with a newborn than some psycho off of Craigslist. Trust me, just don't do it. I've been there. Roommate states that he and new husband just can't move right now due to BS extenuating circumstances. Like how fake real job is too stressful during the summertime. He would rather illegally sublet from us indefinitely once the lease is up, and it'll be totally fine living with five people and a baby and two dogs. They'll probably be out by the end of summer. We don't want to argue with roommate despite new baby being due in March and lease being up in April, so we agree to find a new place. Roommate and new husband can find another roommate. We give required notice of said intentions to our landlord. Roommate informs landlord that he will be staying. We find a nice place for $400 a month less than our current place in late February and sign a lease in early March to move in April. Everything is great. Things begin to go further downhill. Roommate is all over the place. Nice one day, a-hole the next. Baby is late. We decide to move in early to new place so new mom and dad can have some peace with new baby and we can leave this toxic environment. We pay pro-rated rent for March for new house in addition to March rent for old house. Roommate begins to lose his ever-loving SH. Trump announces disaster declaration. Baby girl comes 316 via C-section. We move all of our SH out in the middle of a global effing pandemic with a newborn effing baby one week after her birth. Roommate accuses brother and I of endangering his life for collecting our belongings out of our own effing house. Roommate says terrible things to me. Roommate apologizes for terrible things. We get a puppy. Roommate states that they will not be continuing lease in said house. After we've moved with a newborn baby in the middle of a global effing pandemic because they can't afford it anymore, when all we wanted was to be there originally. Roommate states they will withhold deposit as last month's rent from landlord and pay us our deposit himself. I suspect they never intended to pay any money at all. Puppy eats a sock. Roommate says we can go F ourselves, but I'm also a saint for being so patient with him while he spews toxic nuclear waste all over me for the past two weeks. All we want to do is get the last of our SH out and clean the effing house so we can get our effing deposit back. Roommate bars us entry to house and claims that he's spoken to a lawyer and he will call the cops if we come back because we are endangering his life and we have no legal right to enter. Roommate says we're broke, have no money, and he will make sure we don't get our deposit back. We're piece of SH human beings, etc. Brother and I decide to call the landlord and explain the situation in detail, calmly and truthfully. Landlord sides with us and states that we did give her notice and that we would be leaving at the end of the lease term and we're entitled to walk through in whatever portion of our deposit is applicable and she's happy to escort us on the property with police escort in tow. Landlord states that roommate has not contacted her since he asked for a reduction in rent and requested to re-sign the lease without a deposit. Landlord says she isn't trying to play no games and she has a son in his last year of college. She states that we actually were the only ones who paid rent and deposit all payments transferred directly through brother's account, and she will be depositing all of the deposit directly back to us, and y'all can work it out amongst yourselves. We tell landlord we're sorry roommate is trying to F her over. Landlord is sad that we couldn't stay, but she understands. Brother and I are happy and relieved to be done with this psycho. Roommate proceeds to call landlord and realize how much he has effed himself, proceeds to try and apologize to us. Very sorry that he's now responsible for $4,000 worth of rent, due to not giving proper 60-day notice to vacate, property, and may lose another $500 in deposit money. Just wants to talk, except neither me nor brother will answer any calls or texts. We are done. Puppy finally threw up the sock. Karma's an effing B. I literally could not make this SH up if I tried. The world is a literal dystopian nightmare fever dream and everything is fine. It's my birthday. Let's party like it's 2012 and Obama just won re-election. Only safety and six feet apart with very clean hands. And don't forget to not touch your effing face. The second story is... Company demands 100 free fabric masks from a disabled impoverished seamstress. For context, I'm the disabled poor as F seamstress. I had to quit working at 30 years old due to severe full body CRPS causing fatigue and extreme pain. I got hosed on disability and live on $900 a month now. My mom, a seamstress who used to make wedding gowns, taught me how to sew as a kid and I love it. It's awesome getting to make things exactly how you want them, but my screwed up nerves aren't as fond of sewing. It can cause a good deal of pain if I sew for too long. It starts with the feeling of a cold yet burning gel slowly spreading from my shoulders down my back, and by the end my leg can feel broken and my feet are on fire. It's lots of fun. Sarcasm. When COVID hit and they announced that fabric masks help, I said F the pain, it's worth it, and I began pumping out masks for family and friends, plus some neighbors. 
I gave away the first 30, but started running out of the right supplies with money being so tight, I couldn't afford more. So I asked people to donate $2 per mask if they were financially able to. Some people gave more, including my amazing neighbor N. Seriously, one of the best neighbors ever. Super sweet lady. N began asking if I could make masks for her coworkers, and she took them and mailed them for me. Then one day, N texted me to ask if I'd be able to make 100 masks for a company. Apparently, someone who ended up with one of my masks loved it and owns a company with about 100 employees. He wanted to give each employee a mask. The business owner, B.O., texted me to ask about the order. I said, sure, I can do it. It'll take me about one to two weeks as I work solo and am disabled. I'd want $5 per mask, as this order is a huge one. I wanted some sort of profit. At that time, many mask sellers on sites like Etsy were charging upwards of $20 per mask, so my $5 was dirt cheap. In the end, B.O. ghosted me. N finally got her friend, B.O.'s wife, to admit that he found it ridiculous he was being charged more for a big order. The guy wanted them for $1 each. Oh yeah, and he felt four days was sufficient to sew them all. That would have meant killing myself, barely sleeping and landing myself in a wheelchair for weeks while I recovered, all for the privilege of losing $100 on the order. It was heavily implied that as I'm disabled, I should have been grateful he was willing to pay it all. By now I'm far more aware of what my services are worth. I donated, or sold at bare cost, the first 200. Since then I've begun selling on Etsy, and have produced at least a further 200 masks since then. I'll never again consider a large order without both a slight markup and ample time. It's simply not worth it. And the last story is… I told you, the veranda was closed. My building was a mixed-use property. We had five office towers, a food court, and two floors of retail. One unique feature of our building was that on the second floor, we had an outdoor veranda that a lot of the office workers like to sit on and eat lunch. It was a very concrete jungle, as it was pretty much all cement and decorative rock, with some benches and planters of greenery, but it was better than the food court. Thing is, this was also in Canada, where Canadian geese like to nest pretty much anywhere they can find. For those unfamiliar, Canadian geese will return to the same spot every year to nest, and while they are a protected species, so you can't touch, hurt, or kill them, or destroy their nests or eggs, they honestly don't need that protection. They can handle SH on their own. They're effing demons with feathers. Every year, spring would roll around and like clockwork, we would get two or three pairs of geese on the veranda building their nests. So we would simply lock the doors to the area and put up sorry clothes signs. We would call in a wildlife company that had special permission from the federal government to relocate geese and their nests. But they would often take a week or more to get around to us. Until then, the veranda was closed. One day, the company that owned the building had a couple of bigwigs in from another country for a big meeting and tour. Well, apparently, the biggest bigwig was not pleased that the veranda was closed, and he demanded it be opened up so they could see it. Building manager took an earful over it, and then called me to come unlock it. I arrive and started to explain why the veranda was closed, but I just got a very knowing look from the building manager. So I shrugged, unlocked it, and held the door open for biggest wig. I decided to stick around and keep the door ajar and just wait. It took a grand total of about a minute before I heard yelling, and another 30 seconds or so before the entourage all came barreling back towards the door, in a full panic running at full speed. As soon as they made it through the door, I shut it just in time to keep three very angry, very violent geese from getting into the building. While Biggest Wig was trying to smooth himself out while still extremely flustered, I locked the door and asked, So, what do you think of the veranda? The look the building manager shot me looked like he was about to shove me onto the veranda with the geese, so I decided to quickly take my leave. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you liked it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button.